fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And joining us, as we said, uh, Roberta Grimes. Uh, thank you for being here with us. I'm delighted to be with you. This is wonderful. We're going to have fun. I, uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, so let's, let's start out with telling the uh, audience who you are. I'm a business attorney who has a very sober-sided life. i um, been married 42 years to the same man, all of that. But when I was eight years old, I had an experience of light that transformed my life and made me obsessed with finding out what happens at and after death. Because that was the only way I could think that I would ever be able to figure out what had happened to me when I was a child. And it worked. I know now what it was that happened to me then, and I know so much more. And so I wrote The Fun of Dying. The first edition came out in 2010, and uh, I followed it with The Fun of Staying in Touch late last year, which talks about the signs the dead give to us. And I'm spending my life basically uh, helping people understand the truth about their own eternal natures. Like what changed from being uh, an attorney to actually writing books? Um, well, when I was in 2009, I uh, just about April, just about now of 2009, I decided that I had had a perfect life. I've got children, I've got grandchildren, I have a very successful career working for clients I love, and I have a wonderful marriage. So it's perfect. And I decided I should give back. So. Uh, I started to give my life to God, and the way I did it with, was with gratitude affirmations. I started to pray and still do. Thank you for giving me work to do. Thank you for showing me how to do it. And within two months, I found myself writing The Fun of Dying. And I've, I've been doing so much since then. I just look for guidance and, and follow the guidance. So what can you tell us about The Fun of Dying? Well, we, the, here's the thing. Um, because neither... Mainstream science, which is based in atheistic materialism, that's actually what they call their fundamental dogma. You can find those words in print. Because mainstream science refuses to look at anything related to death or the afterlife, and mainstream Christianity is stuck in dogmas that are 2,000 years old and won't look at anything, there's a tremendous amount of consistent evidence which nobody knows about. And only if you dig, as I started to dig when I was in my 20s, only if you dig do you begin to find it. But I, I concentrated most of my research, initially at least, in communications received through deep trans mediums and automatic writing and a little bit of channeling. But before 1950, there was a heyday of communication that started in the late uh, 19th century and went through the, almost the first half of the 20th. Lots of communications, and they were being um, sort of masterminded by teams of the dead who were trying to get to us word of their survival. I think it was supposed to come through at the same time uh, the wonderful Max Planck was uh, leading the, the charge to uh, quantify quantum mechanics and, and discover what it was, because it's actually quantum mechanics sheds a lot of light on what we're learning from the dead. But what they did was ignored. However, it's not being ignored anymore. A lot of researchers are studying what they've done and what, the, what these people did uh, 100 years ago. And what's beautiful about it, really beautiful, is that it's all perfectly consistent. Hundreds of communications. It's clear they all, even though they all had different experiences, the physics is the same, the process is the same, the way it looks is the same, the way it acts is the same. Everything is the same about this place these people went. Now, knowing that they communicated over maybe 50 to 60 years, and both from the United States and from Great Britain, and nobody was reading these communications until recently, knowing all of that, it's impossible for it not to be real. It's perfectly consistent. There were there are no outliers in the literature at all. So, what can you tell us about dying? Like, what's what's what happens when we die? Well, a few things need to be sort of understood as a basis. 
for what we're going to say. The first is your mind is eternal. Max Planck discovered this. This was his greatest discovery, and he's a revered early 20th century, late 19th century physicist. But he discovered that human consciousness is primary, and it has to pre-exist the universe. That's big. When you know that about yourself, then th this will all make more sense. There's also the fact that nothing is material. Everything is energy. Even the room around you and the world around you, which you think is pretty material, is not. It's all made of energy, tiny, tiny vortices of energy. And the scientists know this. They don't like it, though, because they used to think it was made out of particles. But those particles are just vortices of energy. And... In fact, last summer, there was a, uh, was a symposium in which they tried to decide what to call the particles now that they know they're just vortices of energy, and they decided to keep calling them particles. I think that maybe that was sentimental. I have no idea. But it's all energy. And right in the same place where we are, there are, there are six, perhaps seven levels of inhabited reality, exactly in the same place. The best way to understand it is to think of your, of your brain uh, as just a two-way radio and a head meat ro uh, the head of a meat robot. And right now, uh, it, it's on a specific channel, and it's a, a specific, actually, sub-channel. So your mind, which is a television set, right now is tuned to that body and tuned to this level of reality. That's how precise the tuning is. And that's why you think you're in that body, but you're not. Your mind, that eternal part of you, is just tuned temporarily here. So when you die... All it does is to tune to a slightly higher level of reality, just as if you went from channel 2 on a TV to channel 5, and it picks up a whole new solid reality. That's how death happens. What's the transition then? So um, when you die, what happens to your um, conscious? Well, what, what happens as we approach our deaths is that the fact that we are eternal beings begins to dawn on us again. I mean, there's an amnesia that sets in here, and it's deliberate so that you'll take seriously this very brief moment of life on Earth in this particular lifetime. And as people get close to death, they start to see what, what are called deathbed visitors. These are typically people that we love and we thought were dead, but they're, of course, not dead at all. And usually they appear to us young and healthy. could be pets, too. It could be one or two. It could be a crowd. Sometimes there are reports of parties around people's deathbeds of a lot of people who showed up. And when we see them, when we see the first ones, we realize, of course, we remember everything. We know we're going to believe and everything will be fine. And we, we do. We then move out of our bodies. People who've been through this say that it sort of feels like energy leaving our, our hands and feet and moving up into our torso and then leaving, typically from the top of the head or sometimes from the chest, and forming into a, a, a whole new body outside which is of, of your this physical body, which is still attached to this physical body by what, by what the Bible calls a silver cord. Some people can see the cord, some people can't. It doesn't really matter. That's what keeps your physical body alive. And it's been very tough because throughout your whole life you've been routinely traveling out of body while, while your body slept. But when it's time to leave your body, this cord frays and you get out of your body and the cord kind of disintegrates. At that point, your body dies. And you're, however, you're more alive than you ever were. And it feels great. People say it feels wonderful. But think about it. You've been imprisoned in a boat anchor. That, that awful dying body uh, had to become very weak and, and very sort of crippled in order for you to be able to die. Bodies resist dying because that's when they're really going to die. Although you don't die, your body does. So you've been trapped inside that thing, and suddenly you're free. You feel young, healthy, light. You can float on the air. You're happy. And all around you are people you used to think were dead or who are your loved ones, and they're as solid as you are. So it's a glorious, glorious feeling. Here's the risk, though, and I want everyone listening to just be aware that this is a risk. All around your bed, there are people who love you, who are still in bodies, and they, they're worried that, my goodness, he died. She died. Feel for a pulse. Oh, this is terrible because, of course, your body has stopped breathing. That's a moment of risk because you know you're fine and your impulse is to say, hey, wait a minute. Here I am. Look, I'm great. Don't worry about me. I'm, I'll be back. It's all great. But you can't do that because if you try to communicate with the living, you'll lower your vibratory rate, which is already higher than it was when you were in your body, and you'll lose your ability to perceive your deathbed visitors. That's how we make ghosts. 
People get stuck out of time, out of the possibility, basically out of the normal transition pattern if they focus on on their the living. So you can't do that. You've got to go with your dead loved ones. And once you're aware they're taking you, which is to, as I say, this whole new solid reality, just in the same place but in a, on a higher frequency, once you're there, you'll have the ability to, to contact your loved ones. That's what the fun of staying in touch is about. It's about the signs that dead give us and also the wonderful ways that we, while who are still in bodies, can, can contact the dead. So if you were um, a person that um, did lower your vibration and reach out, um, you say that's how we get ghosts. Uh, what would happen to you then as a ghost? What seems to happen is that you get stuck outside of time. Understand that time is just an artifact of this illusory material universe. It's, nothing is material, everything is energy, and as part of this universe, we have an arrow of time that goes in only one direction. The physicists know there's no earthly reason for time to go in only one direction, and in fact, in the most of reality, what they know themselves is more than 95% of reality, there is no time. So you're already out of your body, you're out of the material reality in which we've been spending this brief lifetime, and yet you haven't gone where the dead go either. So you're stuck outside of time. You think it's one afternoon. You, you, what seems to happen with most people is that they just go about their routines. People who, I'm from the Northeast, and in Massachusetts there are houses that are like, 1600s and some people who buy them will say you know there's sometimes we see this this woman dressed in old-fashioned clothes and she goes right through the wall we don't understand that well when she was alive there was a door there and she is repeatedly going through her same routine hundreds of years later because she was distracted at the wrong time and she's stuck here they have to be rescued and one by one they are being rescued this is the kind of work if someone's very interested in doing it it's work we can do while we're still in bodies i know because experimentally i've done it it's an amazing experience and um but anyway so yes they'll eventually be rescued but what a pity when you don't have to go through that at all just go with your visitors and then you will be able to communicate very easily and and comfort those you love so you can still communicate after you've um, crossed over, you would say, once you once you die, once you've died. Once you have completed the transition, yes. Not only can you communicate, but it's it's not that hard for you to communicate. The problem is, I, I detail in the fun of staying in touch uh, some of the many many ways that the dead are contacting us. It seems to be a natural process. Once we've died, we are very aware because we can lower our vibratory rate once we're there and we've completed the process of transition, we can lower our vibratory rate again and be right there in the room with those we love. And we can experience the pain they're suffering over our loss. And we don't want them to suffer. So we give them signs. And these signs, some of them seem to be ancient. Uh, I, my guess is they date back to caves when people were able, people died, they were fine, their loved ones were suffering, and so they would leave bright white pebbles, for example. Nowadays, the, the dead will give us coins, typically pennies, although sometimes other other denominations. I know someone whose mother leaves quarters, and I wish everybody did that, but, you know, they, most of them just leave pennies. Or they leave feathers, which is another thing that they, of course, could have done, you know, thousands of years ago. More recently, they've learned to mess with electricity, and that's a very common thing that the dead will do now. They'll make the TV turn on and off, make it change channels, uh, you know, flip um, stations on your car radio. They'll do things or, or also blink lights, turn lights on and off. And I, I give examples in the fun of staying in touch of, of things that have happened to me and happened to others in the area of electrical communication. Or they'll put songs in the music when you get in the elevator or walk into a store or when you turn on your car radio. They'll make songs that are important uh, come on the radio for you. It's amazing what they can do, but their minds are much more powerful than ours. Our, we have powerful minds, but while we're in bodies, our bodies act as limiters on our mental abilities, and therefore our minds are, we, we, we can't, you can't look at that little bottle or something standing on the table and make it jump up in the air, but a dead person easily can do that. Your, their minds are very powerful. They can manipulate matter very easily. In fact, it's apparent that the pennies, the feathers, the other things they leave for us are what are called apports. 
they're literally dematerialized at another place in time and made to appear in front of us. So what's what's the point of that? Like so when um when we cross over and we and we become our spirits that we were, I guess what happens to it? Like what what's what goes on then? Do we reincarnate? Do we stay at this next level? There's what I think of as R and R. There's a period of time, and since there's no time there, this can be basically eternal. When we're with those we love in a beautiful, earth-like, solid place, and we have homes, and it's much bigger than here. People say it must be crowded. It's not, because each of the levels of reality and the uh, post-death reality, and there seem to be six. There, there's some question about whether we can call the seventh an actual le- inhabited level, or whether it's simply the source level. But certainly the, low, the, the six that are between this level and the level that's the source are inhabited by people who used to be in bodies and will be back into bodies at some point. They live in houses. They, you can be very far from everybody else if you choose because there's no time, no space. There's a lot of room. Space just isn't even a factor there. So what are we doing in this life then? Maybe. We're learning. This is school. Everybody who's in a body now has chosen to come here with a great deal of excitement, planning very difficult things into li- into their lives, very much as you would go to the gym. Because once we are, are back in our eternal selves, what we crave is spiritual development. It's, it's the, the physics of the afterlife is spiritual. The, the higher our vibratory rate, the higher the level to which we can go. We can't go higher until we've earned it by spiritual growth. And it's very hard to learn to grow spiritually there because life is perfect there. It's like, you know, if you, if you sit at your desk all day, you're going to be flabby physically. Well, we're, we, we're, we feel we're flabby enough that we want to come back and strengthen those spiritual muscles. So we plan difficult things into our lives very much as you might want to try different machines in the gym to really we're really really trying to strengthen ourselves spiritually for most of us the lessons seem to be two we're here to learn to love perfectly and to forgive completely that's it i i tell people the easiest way to understand why we're here is to just buy a new international version of the bible forget what it doesn't matter what your religion is but someone came 2,000 years ago and told us all this stuff in great detail. It's astonishing how completely the Gospels agree with what the afterlife evidence now tells us. So if you get a red-letter copy of the Gospels and you just keep reading those words, that will tell you exactly why you're here. And just internalize them and live by them, and you'll make the most progress you can possibly make while you're here. doesn't matter. This is not a religious recommendation. This is purely a factual recommendation. So read read the Bible for no read the Gospels read the Gospels. The only part of the Bible that I would I recommend people read is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the words of someone who walked the earth two thousand years ago, knowing things about God, reality, death, and the afterlife that we could not have confirmed in any way until the twentieth century. Even little things. It's amazing the consistencies between the Gospels and what the afterlife evidence now tells us is true. So, so there's no real particular religion that works. No, uh, all understand what a religion is. There have been a, a series of great teachers who have come here to try to help us learn how to make the most progress while on Earth, because we're here to make progress spiritually. This is a very, very tiny blip in an eternal life. All of those teachers have been heard by people who didn't really understand what they were were hearing. Let's be frank. But they were superstitious and fearful, so they built superstitious and fearful stories around these wonderful teachers, and those superstitious and fearful stories turn into religions. And that's true of every religion I've ever studied, and I majored in religion in college. I've done a lot of study of, of the world's religions. I'm not saying anything against them. If you want to be have a religion... Be my guest. I mean, everybody should do what what resonates spiritually because we're all at a different place spiritually and your religion may be helping you. But just understand that there are universal truths. There is a real God and that, that God is nothing but love. Okay. Nothing. So all of the judgment that your religion may have, that, that came from man. That didn't come from God. 
Yeah, exactly. I, I sort of agree with that one. The, <laughs> so when when we're doing this, how how do you know what you would – can you – like I'm trying to get to this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, past life regressions, how does that work? So it, is that sort of like we've been in this uh, uh, meat body before? We have been in a meat body before and we will be in one again. Nearly all of us will. The 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 question of how many lives we live before we are able to ascend out of needing to reincarnate or wanting to reincarnate is unclear. It could be hundreds, could be thousands. It doesn't really matter. But understand that outside of this level of reality, there is no time. So the, the upper level beings tell us that in a way we cannot imagine, makes my eyes cross to think about it, all our lives are happening at the same time from their perspective. When one um, ascended being said, think of it as a bucket from which each lifetime is dipped and back into which each lifetime is poured. That bucket is you. You are growing in all these ways, and your lifetimes are affecting one another. For example, you talk about past life regression. There's a therapy associated with it, which is very powerful. If you can be taken to the lifetime where your phobia, for example, of heights began, because you got pushed off a cliff or something, if you can be taken to that period in a regression session and recall that experience, it makes the phobia disappear. I know because it's happened to me. But there's another thing, another sort of natural corollary to this, which is that you can also be taken to future lives. And it may be that the problem you're having now has its roots in a life in the year 2421. Okay. And so, and and what about the bad things that we choose? Um, I know, obviously, there's some things we're choosing as lessons and to learn and to face the challenges, I guess. Um, but what about the people that choose really bad things? There, there are two kinds of bad things you could choose. One is a bad thing to happen to you. That that's a muscle strengthening exercise in the gym. You chose to have your family die in a fire. You chose to have uh, the, you know, whatever terrible things happen in your, you chose to have go bankrupt. You chose those lessons because you can grow spiritually from them in ways you cannot grow in any other way. One of the things they tell us, and I'm coming to believe it really is true, is that every sub-adult who dies, every child or young adult up to probably early 20s who dies is a very advanced being who chose to come and have an early life, uh, you know, early death from a, a life here as a gift to the family because that's a wonderful way for people to grow, to go through that experience. Now, I, I wouldn't choose it. I have friends who've lost children. And they, they all say, I, I would never have chosen this. But that's what they tell us. And from the perspective of eternity, it makes sense because the child, of course, is not dead at all. But there's another kind of bad thing that we could choose which is we could choose to do evil we could choose to be a hitler or we could even just choose to rob banks and you know beat up old ladies those are all things we can choose and if we choose them they give us tremendously negative uh, um, results in terms of our spiritual progress we can set ourselves back a lot by making negative choices while we're during this lifetime that's what I was sort of getting at. So what happens to those people then? Like if, if we choose to be like a Hitler like me, or something in that area, like we're, we're, we're killing people or we're a serial killer or something like that, um, what's going to happen to us then? What happens to all of us is that we have a life review, which is an opportunity to look at all the events of this lifetime from the perspective of everybody we affected for good or ill. It's it's like a holographic total review of your life. You will feel and you will get to feel as others felt everything that happened in your life. Now this happens when you are in usually in a in a large hall with your your guides around you. You're out of the life. All the things we think we could I could justify. I had to kill that guy. Whatever. I could justify anything while I'm here. But there you can't justify anything. And you're told first to forgive everybody that you ever encountered who hurt you and I've never seen a case where people didn't forgive everybody I was at Auschwitz and you were a guard, a, one of the guards ah, forgive it easily because we know it was just a play it wasn't really real but then you you turns out you were one of those guards forgive yourself for all the harm you did while you were there you can't do it it's it's impossible 
So when we're asked to forgive ourselves, that's kind of the, the moment when we determine what our level really will be in the afterlife. If you can't forgive yourself for what you've done, your vibratory rate lowers and lowers until you end up at the lowest afterlife level of which we're aware. Jesus called it the outer darkness, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and that's exactly what goes on there. It's full of demons who used to be people. It's cold, dark, smelly, and disgusting. And you can't get out without help. You've got to be rescued one by one. Now, I'll give you an anecdote. The anecdote is, I don't, I've read this just once. I don't know if it's right. The anecdote is that Hitler managed to forgive himself because he didn't do this stuff. He ordered it. And apparently he didn't have the same kind of life review as the guards did. The people who carried out the Holocaust apparently are all over the lower levels now and in anguish over what they did because they knew better. They, they went along to get along, and they caused incalculable pain to innocence. There's just, that's something that's going to take eons for them to straighten out. So, but they do eventually straighten it out, do you think? Or? The, wor- the word is that we will all, all, eventually we will, in time, rejoin the source. In fact, in time, we already have rejoined the source. Basically, it all turns out well. But outside of time, which is where we are when we enter the afterlife, uh, this go- this is a process that seems to go on forever. Because with the earth still so benighted, with human consciousness still so clueless, we're we're creating more and more people who are going to have that moment when they can't forgive themselves and they're going to put themselves in the bad place. So one of the things that seems to be happening now, and you and I are obviously part of it, is an effort is being made, being orchestrated way above our pay grade, to raise the consciousness of the planet so more and more people are aware of these truths, because then they're going to live their lives very differently than they're living now. When you're living in eternity, you really take your lessons a lot more seriously, and you you understand the standards for living our lives are so much stricter than we ever thought while we were here. Just loving some people and not others is not what the what the plan is. Universal love is the plan. Forgiving only the people you kind of can make a deal with in your mind. Mm-mm. Forgiving the, the person who murdered your child, that's part of the plan. Okay, the subject, the fun of dying and the fun of staying in touch. Our guest, Roberta Grimes, will be back right after this break. So do you see the world getting better? Eventually? It will get better, yes. I see it already now. I'll tell you what ha- what's happening. More and more people are becoming less religious, more spiritual. That's what the the surveys show, and this is happening all over the weird world. More and more people are becoming more open to these truths. I mean, it's clear to us that mainstream science is off the rails. It went off the rails a hundred years ago when it's when it refused to look at this information that was being given to it, and it still refuses. It still got dogmas that it has to adhere to but that's going to change and i'll tell you in a minute how what's going to make it change but more and more people are becoming open when the fun of dying came out in 2010 it was just at the end of a period when victor and wendy zamet are australians who've been doing this work for 25 years and they tell me that as recently as even 10 15 years ago they were hearing they were getting hundreds of emails a week from people who were just furious with them, scientists and religious people, for bringing up this stuff. And then suddenly, right about the, around the time that my book came out, and it had nothing to do with my book, but obviously my guides knew I couldn't take that kind of treatment, right about 2010, the world changed, and they say they have gotten almost no complaints since then. Because people are learning at some level below conscious so far, people are beginning to understand there is a truth greater than anything we have known, and that truth is glorious. Yeah, I've talked to Victor a few times, actually. <laughs> oh, he's a wonderful man, and his wife, uh, Wendy, is is the same. They are such courageous people. I love them to pieces. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing is, but with, with, with people becoming more spiritual, I think that's true, and less religion, um, but I'm finding that it's polarizing people more, but... Um, because you have more extremes now. I mean, look at the things going on with uh, Indiana, for instance, and, and, and how it's polarized. People either yes or no. There's no in-between. And it seems to be drawing, the, it's separating them. It seems to be they're getting more segregated. 
Th- that's an artificial uh, problem that's political. It's not really spiritual at all. What, what I think is going to happen is that people will begin to come together around the teachings of Jesus because certainly if you're a Christian, it's hard to deny that the Gospels should be the core of your religion, right? Right. And I can show people who have never been religious that the easiest way to make the best, most spiritual progress from a purely secular perspective is to internalize the words of Jesus in the Bibles, to consider him to be the, the best guru there ever was. So if, if Christians and people who are not Christians can agree on a core set of teachings that will allow us to all to advance spiritually together, you know, we get past nonsense like the, you know, what, what is or is not, uh, to be done with uh, with um, people who who have a different sexual orientation. I mean, let's be frank. The whole problem is that mainstream Christians still adhere to the Old Testament. That's the core of what they teach, which to me is just appalling. Jesus says in the Gospels that he came to fulfill the Old Testament. He also said that he, he was boiling all the Ten Commandments down to two. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, this is important, he said, in that consists all the law and the prophets. Now, the, when he was walking the earth, the law and the prophets was what they call the Old Testament. So he first said, I fulfilled it, and then he said, I'm boiling it down. This is all that it is. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. That's it. So anyone who still thinks that because of the Old Testament, uh, we have to condemn people who happen to love someone of the same gender, that person is just not listening to Jesus. Let's listen to the Lord. I think that's the important thing. Right, right. Because it's, it's changed so much over the years. You know, I mean, with... Um, not not only just same sex, but the um, just the whole idea of of, of people that are uh, together without being married, you know. Yes, and and the thing is, the problem is that it, this is marriage is religious, but it's also secular. Um, the 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 uh, the state sanctions marriages, and the the state chooses, or the federal government chooses to give certain privileges to people who are married, both I'm an attorney and, and it makes a huge difference whether you're married or not, how you're treated under the, the um, estate tax laws and certainly under income tax laws as well. You can't have there be a, uh, a privilege. I mean, under the Equal Protection Clause, we all need to be treated equally. You can't say just because you happen to be attracted to people of the opposite sex, uh, you, you can't you you lose some of the protections of the law. You can't say that. I mean, the, the, it's inevitable that the religious people will lose, and the only way that they could have won would have been if they had understood at the start that they had a problem, and they had said, all right, let's say marriage is just a private thing inside the churches. Let's have there be uh, a, a union that people can have on the government level, and any two people can have it. And it doesn't have to be based in a sexual relationship. It could be Two people who are living together for life, and they—they're not. They're, they could be, could be even three people. I don't even care. We're talking. <laughs> we're talking the 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 government sanctioning a, mer- a family unit, and I think that what's happened to our culture in the, since 1968, 69, uh, uh, as the family started to fall apart because of what Johnson had done in terms of giving people incentives not to be married. And uh, since then, seeing what's happened to our culture, it's pretty clear. That, and, and also studies of children, rearing kids inside a family is very important and actually have, giving everybody the stability of, of a family is important. I've been married, it'll be almost, it's almost 43 years. Seems like a minute, but that's what it is. Now, I, there, are, there were times in those <laughs> years I would have paid you quite a bit to take them, yeah. you know, but yeah. we stuck it out and I'm very glad we did and we've had a wonderful marriage. Uh, the, the the bad times are tiny. The, the the wonderful times are better and better. But those are fruits that only come when people understand the the priority that needs to be given to living in families. Yeah. And so, what do you think is happening uh, with with um, ISIS and that sort of thing? Then, or is that something that they're choosing in their own beliefs, or what? Like what? The, 
it's certainly causing a lot of havoc. I think that what will be seen to be happening a uh, hundred years from now when they study this period is that both Christianity and Islam, and probably other religions too, are having to resort to militancy in order to remain relevant. I mean, they have got to, because unfortunately they built their religion not around the teachings of Muhammad. I haven't studied them, but I'm sure he's another of the great prophets who came and was misunderstood. The, they're, they've built their teachings around 8th century uh, practices and beliefs, which, it, which would be as foolish as if Christians, as actually they sort of did, had built their teachings around 1st century Judaism. It's the, it's, the, it's the teacher who is important, and, and his teachings are important. But in order for even relevancy to be maintained, religions are having to become militant. And by doing that, they're signaling their own weakness. They're saying, we can't remain important unless we turn violent. That's the last stage, I think. I, I, there's no way they can win. Nobody wants what they're selling, and, and they don't want what they're selling because most of us yearn for personal freedom. We learn, we yearn for a personal relationship with God. What Jesus said, I think Jesus came to abolish religions, to tell you the truth. It's ironic when you see what happened, but he said, you don't need a clergyman. And what he said about clergymen, you would not want to print. It's amazing. You go read the Gospels, and it makes you wince. He couldn't stand them. And he said, oh, you don't need them. All you need to do is go into your room and pray to God in secret, and the God that sees in secret will reward you. He said, God is spirit. People don't remember, and this is so important, it's central, that when Jesus walked the earth, to talk against the prevailing religion was an immediate death sentence. He wanted to see, he knew he was going to buy the farm in the end, but he wanted to stay alive just long enough to be able to, to teach what he had come to teach. And what he taught over I think it was three and a half years, however long he stayed alive, was was beautiful and true. It, I can prove to you now exactly the, how, how true it was, by just by what the dead tell us today. And that, to me, is uh, the, the greatest miracle I've ever seen, that we had someone 2,000 years ago who knew this stuff and taught it to us. And he was trying to get us to relate to God directly. So if, so if that's the purpose of our lives on earth, to build that relationship with God, then none of these religions... Is, is going to survive, none of them. Wow. And so what are people that commit suicide? What happens there? Depends on whether or not they can forgive themselves. The, the word it seems to be that people who kill themselves when they're sub-adults forgive themselves easily. There's not a, not a worry there. There's a tremendous amount of help for them. People who are dying or who are very old and kill themselves don't seem to give a, have a problem because the question for them is, do you forgive yourself? And, you know, maybe they died a few months early because they had cancer and they killed themselves. It's not a problem. They forgive themselves. But someone who set a difficult course of, financial, of spiritual growth that maybe was financial problems, uh, his wife left him, all kinds of negative things like that, and he kills himself at the age of 43. Those people seem to have a lot of trouble forgiving themselves. And if they can forgive themselves, great. And as I say, there's a lot of, of help for them. If he can't forgive himself, he's going to spend a little time on that lowest level. And that's a tragedy. Hmm. And so when you when you say that, um, so how do you get your information talking to the, by by mediums? When, as I say, the, the, the information that I have used to build what I understand to be true has come through uh, deep trance mediums and automatic writing and a uh, little channeling in the first half of the 20th century. I tried not to study anything later simply because I'm not certain I can trust it. There's a lot of, I understand, very good later stuff that confirms all of this, but I don't, uh, everything is that I've studied has been early 20th century. Interestingly, though, I have my own um, podcast series called Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes, uh, which is available, by the way, for free on iTunes. Just go for, go to Seek Reality for Roberta Grimes. We have a, uh, a couple of hundred thousand or, or 250,000 subscribers at this point. But later today, I'll be interviewing Mark Anthony, who's a a psychic medium, fourth generation, very, very good medium. And his latest book is called Evidence of Eternity. And what he does there is to talk about what what the dead are telling him today 
is true about reality and all of these things. All these questions you've been asking me, he answers in his book, Evidence of Eternity. And what's wonderful is he says all the same stuff I'm telling you now. And he's been getting it from people who are talking to him directly. Everybody I've ever met who has done this research sincerely has come up with exactly the same answers. Too in detail. We, 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 when we meet, we complete each other's sentences. It's amazing and wonderful. Wow. And so who do, the, who, do, who do people like that? So mediums are communicating with spirits now. Yes. I had a lot of trouble believing in psychic mediums because when I was doing my research, I didn't have any active... Uh, nobody I really missed. I knew they were fine. So I, they had, even the best ones when I was doing my research had trouble getting anything for me. And so I thought, these people, they're all just fakes. Uh, then I read the wonderful Dr. Gary Schwartz's, um, The Afterlife Experiments, which came out in 2002 or three. And he double and triple blind tested and sometimes quadruple blind tested psychic mediums. And he found that some of them were virtually 100% accurate, even though they had no idea who they were reading. They got no feedback during the reading, all of that. Uh, he, was, uh, he was really blown away, and so was I, because he was skeptical, too, before he started doing the research. So there are some psychic mediums who are good. There are a lot that are not, though, and so they'll do a lot of cold reading or guessing, and uh, that's why psychic mediums have a bad name, because, frankly, there are some whose attempts to to do it well are not as effective as the actual success you'd hope for and i feel bad for them but there are some that are quite legitimate and mark anthony is one the other that i recommend to people is suzanne wilson who uh, i think is just excellent she's the one i use personally i'm using her to communicate with my guides at this point hmm. and so and so when we get to the point where um when we die so do we choose our our time to check out as well we when we plan and we we all plan our lives in great detail we with the people who are going to be in our lives and with our guides and with their guides we work out this plan so we all get the most um, basically we we we, plan, we don't plan every day we we sort of plan what the big events are likely to be but then we meet frequently during the course of our lives while our bodies sleep so we can kind of figure out what to change one of the things we build into our lives is two usually three exit points that our higher consciousness can take when we basically wrung about as much juice as we can out of this particular orange some people will find that their circumstances have changed so much that they check out when they're very young, some middle age, and some when they're old. And uh, so, yes, we do plan our, our deaths, and our higher consciousness makes the decision, although we don't make it consciously. But often, people will know in the year before they're going to die uh, that even though they don't know it at a conscious level, they start to wrap things up over and over and over. I'll hear, he had a heart attack, we didn't even know he had heart disease. But isn't it amazing? A month before he died, he told me what all the passwords were, out of the blue. Or someone will say, I hadn't heard from him in years. And then suddenly, there he was contacting me, and we went out to lunch. It was lovely. And six months later, he was dead. I was amazed. I, I, and sometimes if you go to a, a life uh, celebration for someone and talk to people who knew him that maybe you didn't know before, over and over, you'll hear this story that they reached out or there was something they did to wrap things up in the, in the, in the last year or so of their lives. And so, so what about people that aren't in touch with their um, spirits or spirit guides? Like I recommend it. Um, I had not... Th this, is, this is one of the things... Ever since 2009, I haven't been trying to lead my parade. I've been trying to let God lead it. So it was only when uh, my mother, who died two and a half years ago, it was clear to me she wanted me to contact, big time, to contact her. And so I did. Um, called Suzanne, arranged for a meeting uh, with, my, with my loved ones. And there were 70-odd like people. This was about a month ago. 70-odd people showed up. And so I got to talk to my mother, and the first thing she said was, you were right about everything. I don't know why I was so afraid to leave, but it's terrific here. And, and she said, but you know, I'm traveling around checking your work. So my mother is checking what, what I wrote in The Fun of Dying. How's that for, that's exactly what she would do as well. Such a busybody. But 
the, the, I, there were also 11 people there who were my guides and I hadn't thought that was what I would be doing with Suzanne but a lot of my reading was just what the, what my guides were telling me and it made me realize it's time for me to be more connected with them so I'm going to be working on that this summer that's great but yeah we all have guides we, we have a core spirit guide who is sort of our main person for this life I got to meet him and know a lot about him which amazed me by the way um, and we also, as we as we start to do work, in especially in these fields, but also in other fields as well, we'll we'll get guides who are expert in those areas. I mean, I write fiction and nonfiction, I, and it turns out I have four guides just helping me with my fiction, which explains a lot, mm-hmm. and uh, and three guides working with me on on um, doing this afterlife work. And then four who were, I guess, general guides, one of whom is my main guide. So it takes a lot, a lot of them to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow, I guess. I have no idea why. It's more typical to have one to three guides. But the, we all have them. I don't care who you are. And the more you sort of learn how to communicate with them and, and how they want basically to communicate with you, the better your life will be, not just in terms of learning and growth, but also in terms of happiness. That's the key thing people need to understand about these truths. The more you understand, the happier you are. Are we choosing our guides, or do they kind of choose us? They choose us. When, but when we're, when we're born, we come in with a primary guide, maybe a couple of primary guides, who are going to be there through life. My experience when I was eight was, was my guide showing me that. I didn't know that till much later. But I, was, I woke up in the middle of the night um, when I was eight, in April of April 9th it was of two, of 1955 and I realized there was no God and I was terrified and in the midst of my terror there was a brilliant white light in the room a flash of light and in that light that midst of that light there was a voice that said you wouldn't know what it is to have me if you didn't know what it is to be without me I will never leave you again and at the time, I thought that was great. If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And I went back to sleep. But these experiences stay immediate in your mind. Sixty years later, it feels like it was it was just today that it happened. And in fact, I, it happened a second time because I majored in religion in college, didn't learn a blessed thing because if you don't ask a question, you never get an answer. I still didn't know what had happened to me when I was eight, and I was bummed. So one day uh, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, full daylight, uh, the same light and the same voice said, I will never leave you. So that was when I knew I, A, that I was never alone, and B, I was at the dunce of the universe because apparently nobody else has ever had this happen and it happened to me twice. So that's when I really started to get serious. I was 20 at the time, and that's when I started this search. And so can I, can I ask just about the, uh, what happens to the animals then? How are they in this? What a great story, the story I have to tell you about this. People um, worry about their pets. Every animal of any species that has been loved by a human being is waiting for us healthy, happy, young, and you don't have to walk them, you don't have to feed them. That's one of the things of which we're most certain. If you've had a lot of animals in your life, there'll be a crowd around you of all those beautiful animals you used to love. They're there and they're fine. Animals that are not loved by a human being apparently return to what's called a group soul of their species. Um, so the energy isn't lost. I mean, it's still a kind of mind, and the energy isn't lost. But the energy of, of, the, of an animal's mind that has been loved by a person is somehow differentiated and made into, you know, a, a permanent entity. And they're, they're in the afterlife waiting for us. Do animals have a soul? We are told, we, we ask that question, and upper level beings who've been asked that question say that they are of a different kind of mind. We are of the same mind that brings forth the universe. We are literally part of God. Our minds are part, inextricably part of God, part of one another, indivisible. There's really only one of us here, and that's God. Animals are of a different kind of mind, and some say of a purer kind of mind. They don't go through the same lessons, uh, spiritual growth lessons, they don't need them apparently. So they are of a mind, but they're not the same kind of mind as we have. Well, so we can learn a lot from animals, can't we? <laughs> I would think so. Yes, that's true. I've Certainly I've learned a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's amazing. But this is true, by the way, of farm animals too. My the the reading that I w- w- I was given was held on my grandfather's farm. He was a dairy farmer, and she said it's full of cows. Every cow he ever loved is wa- is there, you know, was waiting for him when he crossed. And my my horse, a few days after he died, gave me a wonderful communication dream in which I got to see how beautiful he is now. So I know he's waiting for me. All those animals you love are waiting for you. Wow. That's great. So what about the people that didn't like you? Are they waiting for you too? <laughs> <laughs> yes. One of the things that's interesting, we, we, two things we do right when we, soon after we, we transition. One is we have a party. Our party's held for us. And they told me they're going to hold that party for me at uh, that farm. I said, I hope it's not going to be soon. They said, no, it'll be a while, but we're, we're, we're going to hold it here. The other thing that happens uh, is that, you know, we go through that life review but but and it, the the order is, tends to vary. But it, what, both of those things happen fairly soon. When you have the party, basically everybody you've ever known, or you were interested in, or people who've ever guided you when you were not involved, well, all kind, uh, everybody shows up. It, they, there doesn't. It's like there's a a, a book, billboard of sorts in everybody's mind, and this notices. This is you know he's having this party. This is where it is, and they all show up. People have said over and over again, talking about their parties, you know, so-and-so arrived, and I couldn't believe he came because I couldn't stand him. He was my horrible boss. And then I realized he was a a great eternal friend of mine. He came into my life and, and gave me all that trouble as a gift to me to help me grow spiritually. And so we just hugged and we laughed about what a fool, you know, how foolish we were on earth and everything. We didn't, he didn't know either. That was why he and I were oil and water. Over and over again, they tell us about meeting people they had hated who now are their eternal friends. So whoever you can't stand, just be aware that person may well be your very best friend in eternity who just has given you a hard time now because that's part of your spiritual growth opportunity. So what do you think that happens to people that have no belief in a God, um, Jesus or any of the gods, and they're totally, um, you know, like a like a church of Satan or something that totally... Sits. No, those are two questions. The yeah. first is, if, you, if you're devoid of beliefs or you're just, you know, just an agnostic, all that matters is how well you've adhered to the teachings of Jesus. You don't have to ever even have heard of Jesus. If you have learned to love as perfectly as possible and forgive as well as possible, you're right up to the, to the higher levels of the afterlife. It doesn't, in other words, it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. God believes in you, and that's all that matters. Now, if you've been an act, active Satanist, someone who is an enemy of God, you'll have a lot of trouble forgiving yourself. So again, you go through that life review, you see what you did, you understand, because there they say the love of God is in the air you breathe. It is in, it's an intense presence in all of the afterlife. In fact, the, the light there is much more much brighter than it is here, and it's always bright. That's the love of God, that light. The light I saw, that's what that light is. And in fact, it fills the universe, and the scientists have found that that's true, but they don't understand what it is they found. It's just amazing to me how clueless they still insist upon being. But if, you, if you've turned away willfully from God, you will have trouble forgiving yourself for that. Because when you get there, you can't get away from God. Right. Okay. So now what are you working on now? You're working on a new book? I met a woman uh, in 2011 who whose his son had died uh, a few years before. I think he died in 2009, and or seven, maybe it was seven. Uh, yeah, seven, of 2007. He was, and I'm convinced this is true, although I'm very skeptical by nature, he's convinced me that he is an ascended being who came to Earth to have a very brief lifetime. He died at 20, so he would be able to educate us and especially educate young people about what's actually true. And I've asked hundreds of questions, and so have others of him. He's never made a mistake. She's clueless. She knows nothing. Bless her heart. But Mikey Morgan is the real deal. And I'm helping him now write his autobiography. Wow. That's exciting. So now, uh, how can people get a hold of you? And how do they um, uh, find your books? Are you doing any um, signings or uh, any um, speaker speakings? 
I, I, my problem is that because I have so much writing that I'm doing and I have ch- grandchildren I help very, with very actively, I don't, I just don't have time to travel anymore. But I do podcasting at webtalkradio.net and there's a new podcast every week. I have the most wonderful people that I interview that we, uh, we talk about all of these things. And as I say, there's an archive on iTunes. Just look for Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes that's there. My website is robertagrimes.com. You can contact me through my website. I answer emails. Um, I love to hear from people who have questions or need guidance, and uh, it's just been a great experience. I was just on Coast to Coast. I heard from hundreds of people. It was it was just, it took me days, and I hardly <laughs> slept, but I answered all those emails, and it was a great experience. Yeah, you get a little so, burst. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, but so it's just robertagrimes.com and webtalkradio.net and iTunes if you just want to listen to podcasts. Uh, some, of the, some of the leading lights in this field, like the Zam, it's like Dr. Gary Schwartz, like R. Craig Hogan, people that are, are just epic leaders in what's happening now um, have been privileged. I, I've been privileged to interview them, and they have been willing to be my guests. And uh, so we have conversations that are there preserved for people to listen to. That's fantastic. Well, again, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for letting me be here, and thank you for letting me say all these things. Oh, I bless you, bless you for just letting me talk. This is this is the best news in human history, and it's wonderful that that you're getting the word out. Bless you. Oh, thank you. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.